At the Last Supper, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am only with you a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. If you knew that you were about to die, what would you tell the people that you love? What memorable hope or dream would you share? What urgent last piece of advice would you offer? In our gospel reading today, we return to the upper room in order to hear Jesus' answer to this difficult question. Judas has left the Last Supper in order to carry out his betrayal. The crucifixion clock is ticking fast and hard, and Jesus knows that his disciples are about to face the greatest devastation of their lives. So he gets right to the point. No parables, no stories, no mean, meaningful sayings full of substance. Just one commandment. One simple, straightforward commandment, summarizing Jesus' deep desire for his followers. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And then right on the heels of the commandment, a promise. Or maybe an incentive. Or maybe a warning. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I also want to point out what Jesus doesn't say. When death comes knocking and the Son of God has mere hours left to communicate the heart of his message to his disciples, he doesn't say, believe the right things. He doesn't say, worship like this or attend a church like that. He doesn't even say, read your Bible or pray every day. He says, love one another. That's it. All of Christianity distilled down to its essence so that maybe we'll pause long enough to hear it. Love one another. What's astounding about this commandment is how badly we've managed to screw it up over the last 2,000 years. In a commentary I read earlier this week, one New Testament scholar names the irony in this way. This new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate and yet it is profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. When I look at my own life, it's not too hard to name why I continually fail to obey Jesus' dying wish. Love requires vulnerability, and I'd rather not be vulnerable. Love requires trust, Love spills over margins and boundaries, and I feel safer policing my borders. Love takes time, effort, discipline, and transformation, and I'm just too busy for all of that. And yet Jesus didn't say, this is my suggestion or recommendation. He said, this is my commandment, meaning it's not a choice. It's not a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of obedience to the one that we call Lord. But what does it mean that Jesus commands us to love? Does love obey orders? My guess is most of us would say no. No matter how influenced we are by Hollywood or romance novels or romantic poetry, we usually think of love as a spontaneous and free-flowing occurrence. We fall in love. Love is blind. It happens at first sight. It breaks our hearts, and it, its course 
never runs smoothly. Even if we put our cultural cliches aside, we know that authentic love can't be manipulated, simulated, or rushed. Those of us who have kids understand full well that, that commanding them to love one another never works. The most we can do is insist that they behave as if they love one another. Share your toys, say sorry, don't hit, use kind words. But these actions, often performed with gritted teeth and rolling eyes, they aren't the same as what Jesus is talking about. Jesus doesn't say, act as if you love. He doesn't give his disciples or us the easy out of doing nice things with closed hearts. And I'm not even sure that I would want him to. Because nothing feels as hollow as a loving act performed mechanically. Besides, I doubt that the people who gathered around Jesus would have done so if they sensed that his compassion was thin or forced. He says, love as I have loved you. As in, for real, as in the whole genuine package, authentic feeling, deep engagement, generous action. Doesn't it sound like he's asking for the impossible? Maybe he is. But imagine what would happen to us. Imagine what would happen to the church and to the world if we took this commandment of Jesus seriously. What could our world look like if we obeyed orders and cultivated this seemingly impossible love? I ask these questions fearfully because I don't know how to answer them, even for myself. I mean, I know fairly well how to do things. I know how to make care packages for the homeless or bring dessert to the church potluck or send checks to my favorite charities. Do I really know how to love as Jesus loved? To feel a depth of compassion that's gut-punching. To experience a hunger for justice so fierce and so urgent that I rearrange my life in order to pursue it. To empathize until my heart breaks. And do I even want to? Most of the time, I'll be honest, I don't. I want to be safe. I want to keep my circle small and manageable. And I want to choose the people I love based on my own affinities and preferences, not on Jesus' all-inclusive commandments. Charitable actions are easy, but cultivating my heart, preparing it to love, becoming vulnerable in authentic ways to the world's pain, those things are hard. They're hard and costly. And yet, this was Jesus' dying wish. Which means that we have a God who first and foremost wants every one of his children to feel loved. Not shamed, not punished, not penalized, not judged, not isolated, but loved. But that's not all. Jesus follows his commandment with a terrifying promise. By this, everyone will know. Meaning love is the benchmark of Christian witness. Our love for each other is how the world will know who we are and whose we are. Our love for each other is how the world will see, taste, touch, hear, and find Jesus. It's through our love that we will embody Jesus and make Jesus relatable, possible, and plausible to a dying world can't speak for you, but this makes me tremble. Because what Jesus seems to be saying is that if we fail to love one another, the world won't know what it needs to know about God. And in the terrible absence of that knowing, it will instead believe lies that draw us further away from God. That the whole Jesus thing is a sham. That there really is no transformative power in the resurrection. That God is a mean, angry, vindictive parent determ determined only to shame and punish his children. That the universe is a cold, meaningless place, ungoverned by love. That the church is only a flawed, 
and hypocritical institution, not Christ's living, breathing, healing body on earth. This is the power we exercise in our decisions to love or not to love. These are the stakes involved in how we choose to respond to Jesus' dying wish, hope, prayer, and commandment. This is the responsibility we shoulder whether we want to or not. But here's our saving grace. Jesus doesn't leave us alone and directionless in the wilderness. He gives us a road map, a clear and beautiful way forward. As I have loved you. Follow my example, he says. Do what I do. Love as I love. Live as you have seen me live. Weep with those who weep. Laugh with those who laugh. Touch the untouchables. Feed the hungry. Welcome the child. Release the captive. Forgive the sinner. Confront the oppressor. Comfort the oppressed. Wash each other's feet. Hold each other close. Tell each other the truth. Guide each other home. For the sake of the world, love one another as I have loved you. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll offer one moment. Uh